With well over 500,000 pouring into publication every year, it's safe to say that the novel might be the most popular manifestation of literature in the present day. Novels are defined by the use of narration, meaning that in most cases, there is always one or more voices guiding you through the story and describing the events taking place. Narration is so ubiquitous that it's practically unnoticeable at this point. The novel, though, has had a long history. The first modern novel, Don Quixote, was published in 1605, almost 500 years ago. So how did we get from here to here? To find out, we'll need to rewind a couple hundred years. Born in 1775 to a middle-class family in the English countryside, Jane Austen published just six novels over her career, none of which drew much attention during her lifetime. Over the years, however, her novels have exploded in popularity, inspiring dozens of adaptations into film, television, and even comics, developing a fan base so fervent they've even been compared to Trekkies. Austen's novels innovated and refined the form in more ways than we have time to discuss in this video, so we're going to focus on just one, which brings us back to the beginning. Narration. In his 2009 book How Fiction Works, literary critic James Wood identifies two basic narrative frameworks for the novel, first and third person. First-person narration comes from the voice of a specific character within the story. For example, I left for Houston that day. Third-person narration takes on a more removed bird's-eye view. He left for Houston that day. This is pretty flat writing, though, so let's spice it up a little bit. Instead of left, we could use struck out, giving us a more adventurous flavor. Let's add fateful in here, too an adjective that provides a sense of danger looming over our protagonist's journey. Great, now we have something to work with. We do hit an interesting snag here, though. Where is the language that we've just added coming from? Does the protagonist have any idea of what awaits him in Houston, motivating the use of the word fateful? Or is that the narrator's addition, which would mean the protagonist is oblivious to his fate? What about the phrase, struck out? Does our protagonist see his journey as an adventurous one? Or is that the narrator again? Frankly, it's a little bit unclear. This is precisely the problem that Jane Austen doubled down on, building an entire style of writing around it. This technique, blurring the lines between third and first person narrative, is sometimes called free indirect speech and Austen elevated it to an art form. Brandishing free indirect speech as her weapon of choice, Austen weaves effortlessly in and out of her characters' minds, in the process creating an almost endless range of effects, from subtle irony to sharp criticism, from comedy to tragedy. In essence, Austen writes on the edge between first and third person narrative exploiting the gap between the two to create her masterpieces. At the time that Austen started to write, free indirect speech hadn't been identified as a technique, let alone utilized to the extent and with the sharp control that Austen demonstrated. In other words, Austen invented free direct speech in a way, and in the process, revolutionized the novel as we know it today. I want to show you an example of how dazzling Austen's narration can be by using an excerpt from my favorite one of her novels, Persuasion. The novel opens by introducing the widowed family head and baron Sir Walter Elliot. Austen's description of the man begins innocently enough by noting his favorite book, The Baritonage, a volume cataloging the English nobility, their titles, ranks, and genealogy. This description, though, takes a sharp turn when we realize that Sir Walter Elliot's favorite page to turn to in this book is the one containing his own name and title. Austen then confirms our mounting suspicions about Sir Walter's personality in one simple line. Vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character. 
It's a harsh judgment, but at this point, we're still standing firmly in the camp of third-person narration. Sir Walter is definitely not self-aware enough to consider himself vain, and there's nothing very emotive or personal about the sentence. Austin sticks with this third-person style for the next couple of paragraphs, but something interesting happens when we move on to the rest of the Elliot family. Sir Walter's obsession with status and rank begins to subtly infect the third-person narrative. Sometimes this comes through almost unnoticeably, with the use of one well-placed word. Speaking of Mary, Sir Walter's youngest daughter, Austin writes, Mary had merely connected herself with an old country family of respectability and large fortune. The merely here hints strongly at Sir Walter's perception of the family that Mary has connected herself to. Without it, we'd have a simple, objective description of the family she's married into. This weaving in and out of Sir Walter's mind comes to a head in one of the most jarring passages in the chapter. After providing a glowing description of the Elliot's firstborn daughter, Elizabeth, we're treated to this sentence, plain and simple. His two other children were of very inferior value. It's clear that the narrator doesn't share this incredibly sad and harsh opinion of the other two Elliot children, especially Anne, who is actually the heroine of the novel. This evaluation then can come only from Sir Walter's perspective. By refusing to soften the statement, however, by alerting us to its source, Austin brings the full brunt of Sir Walter's cruelty and self-interest down on us with shocking effect. In just one chapter, Austin has deftly woven together multiple perspectives and given us a complete overview of the Elliot family both inside and out, and she's done it with barely any of the interruptions of quotation marks and he said, she said asides. As a result, the first chapter, as well as the rest of the novel, flows at a perfect pace, dancing the entire time on the line between third-person narration and first-person experience. This has been just a microscopic example of Austen's use of free, indirect speech. Her six novels are rife with others, and anyone interested in literature would do well to seek them out. These days, free, indirect speech pops up in almost every novel, to the point that it's almost imperceptible to us. Next time you pull a novel off the shelf, though, stop for a second and pay close attention to what you're reading. In all likelihood, Austin's genius and originality is somewhere there, hiding between the lines. Hi everyone, and thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, make sure to subscribe to my channel and follow me on Twitter. Feel free to leave suggestions in the comments about what you'd like to see next, and consider supporting my channel on Patreon to get extra content, hear episodes of my podcast, and most importantly, help me to make better quality content. Thanks again for watching. See you next time.